Our guest speaker today is Nicholas Atkinson, and he is the founding partner of Delta Investment Management, a registered investment advisory firm based in San Francisco. Prior to founding Delta Investment Management, Mr. Atkinson was a partner and portfolio manager of Delta Force Capital, a San Francisco-based hedge fund from 2006 to 2009. Prior to Delta Force Capital, Nick was a managing director for Bank of America Securities and Susquehanna International Group. He is also the co-author of Win by Not Losing, a disciplined approach to building and protecting your wealth in the stock market by managing your risk, published by McGraw-Hill. He graduated from Haverford College, Phi Beta Kappa, with a BA in Economics, and from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. So I'm going to welcome Mr. Nick Atkinson to tell us about what's going to happen in 2022, at least financially. Okay. All right. So just, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot going on in the world. Um, on February 23rd, the, the stock, the S&P closed at 4,225. And right now it's trading at 4,269. So since the Russian invasion began on uh, February 24th, the market's actually slightly higher. Obviously there's a ton of volatility, you know, the setting aside, you know, nuclear disaster the uh, the issue that's pressing now is uh, commodity price increases nickel oil <coughs> wheat all this it's the fastest commodity price increases since 1915 and basically you know that's inflationary but it's not the kind of inflation that the fed can manage with higher interest rates basically it's like 73 74 this this type of inflation will choke off consumption at some level. And the worry is uh, what happens to growth in the United States? That the whole, you know, keeping the economy growing is critical to having a positive outcome in the stock market. So anyway, that's, that's you know, predicting what's gonna happen with the, the situation in Ukraine is essentially close to impossible other than the fact that these kinds of events have occurred in the past, and normally uh, they presented themselves as buying opportunities in the stock market, even though you know it, it's unclear how this kind of a situation resolves itself. Uh, they, they typically historically have been buying opportunities. So that, there's that quick comment on what we're looking at immediately. Just so you know, I work with Mike Crest. We've worked with Mike Crest for a long, long time. We're at Delta Investment Management, and. Um, and so Mike normally sits behind me in this office. All right, let's go to the next slide. Actually, let's go two slides forward. It's, okay, so basically, I don't know how many of you know Mike personally, but he's been managing money for a very, very long time. And his philosophy and approach is that there are times in the, in the market's history when you, you just be better off not owning equity. And then there are times when you wanna be fully involved. So he's attempting to uh, be fully invested in bull markets and equities and then move to the sidelines in bearish situations. Slide, let's go to the next slide. So uh, <coughs> Delta Investment Management is a registered investment advisory firm. We're in San Francisco. We publish things. You know, we, we have a uh, Delta Market Sentiment Indicator that's published in Barron's, which is the sister publication of the Wall Street Journal. They've asked for us that information from us and they publish it weekly and it gives us gives a sentiment outlook. We've also been publishing um, S&P 500 year-end forecast and here are the prior three years. And the point of the slide is to say, uh, in every case, 2019, 2020, and 2021, even though the market was up 31%, 18%, and 26%, and we were predicting numbers kind of like that, uh, we were too conservative. So if we're wrong this year about what we're saying about the market, it's more likely that we're being too conservative than being too bold. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So we publish a, a weekly uh, newsletter, it's free. It gives a, you know, it's about four or 500 words, very short. And it basically says what we're thinking about the stock market any, you know, for the week. And it also has the Delta market sentiment indicator in it. So if that's something you guys have an interest in uh, receiving, and again, it's the only 
the only thing we do with this newsletter is uh, send it, you know, with your information as we send you this newsletter. We don't do anything else with it. Then you can always unsubscribe. But anyway, if you want that newsletter, just send us an email with your name and your obviously your email address to info at deltaim.com. That's right on your screen there, info at deltaim.com. And that will get you our email Friday newsletter. Uh, and again, it's free. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, this is a history of calendar year S&P 500 returns from 1980 forward. And what it shows is that uh, there are these areas, these gray bars are the calendar year return of the S&P without dividends. And the bars above the green horizontal lines are periods of time when there's been no recession. And if you just isolate on those periods of time, what you see is that the calendar year returns are almost always positive. And then you see these circled red areas, those are recessions. And in those circled red areas, the calendar year returns of the S&P are often negative. You also see a bunch of red dots running underneath the horizontal axis. And they've got these red numbers next to them and they're all negative. What those are, are the drawdowns that happen during the year. And you can see that they're drawdowns basically every single year. In non-recessionary years, the drawdowns typically aren't that bad. In recessionary years, they're very bad. They can be, so not only do you have negative calendar year returns in recessionary years, you have big entry year drawdowns. The problem with a big entry year drawdown, by the way, is that people respond emotionally. You know, COVID was a, a classic one. We, we, the S&P dropped 35% in three weeks and the outlook in the world was very unknown. It would have been very easy to have sold your holdings and sat, moved to the sideline and then missed the rally. The market for the year, you know, including dividends was up almost 18%. So it turned out 2020 was a decent year, uh, even with COVID. And here we are, we're, we're in a, we have a war going on in Ukraine and the s and is down roughly 10%. The NASDAQ was down 20% as of yesterday. You, you might think, okay, it's time to sell because this looks really bad. Uh, but what it's going to come down to is, are we going into a recession or not? If we're not going into a recession, you really don't want to sell. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is just a, a tabular form or another chart that says essentially the same thing. And it's, it's showing you a grid of outcomes in the S&P 500 from 1975 forward. On the top line, it says real 10-year treasury yield. And on the, the vertical axis, it says U, US real GDP growth. So as long as GDP growth is accelerating, stable, decelerating, but growing, in other words, anything including growing, all things include growth, that the average return of the S&P 500 is positive. The time when it's negative is when you have decelerating and contracting growth. So in other words, recession, then you get negative outcomes in the S&P. And that's, just, that's what we saw in the prior chart. This is just a different way of looking at it. And this gets you down to, we have rising, a, a rising 10 year treasury and we have decelerating but, growth, but continued growth of GDP. And the average return for the year is roughly, it says 8% since 1975. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the question is, again, I'm going to just keep hammering this. Are we going into a recession or not? That's what we care about. And for the moment, uh, you know, the way we look at it is that we, we have two measures. One, the, the treasury yield curve, is it inverted or not? And what that means is, is the two-year treasury rate higher than the 10-year rate? If that's the case, then the treasury yield curves inverted. Today, that's not the case. The 10-year treasury rate is about 1.9, and the two-year is, I'm just going to look it up right here for kicks, 1.6. So the spread's tightening because the two-year is coming up a lot, and the 10-year hasn't, you know, it's come down actually a little bit lately, but it's definitely not inverted. And then another measure we use to look to know whether we're going to go into recession is the leading economic index which is published by somebody called the Conference Board. And it's 10 economic measures of the economy and they aggregate them into a single number and they look at the percent change month over month. And um, if the six month moving average of that indicator is uh, negative, that's a good sign that we're gonna go into a recession. 
and uh, that's not the case. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the yield curve of the ten-year Treasury. What it just shows is that at every, you know, every expiration, you know, whether it's the three-month, the one-year, the two-year, the five-year, the ten-year, the twenty or thirty, we've got an upwardly sloped yield curve. So that's that's good. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a long history of the inversions in the yield curve. Uh, and what it shows, there's a horizontal dark line there at zero. Uh, when the uh, blue line is below the zero line, what it's saying is the two-year treasury rate is higher than the 10-year, meaning we inverted. And you can see once you drop below that, once the blue line crosses down to the downside through the zero line, we see recessions following. And during periods when it's, you know, it's risen back through and it's above the zero line, uh, there's really not a recession, but recessions are preceded by an inversion of the yield curve. Let's go to the next slide. So what this is, is this is the actual leading economic index change, you know, month over month. And you can see it's been po you know, positive in all months except for February of last year. And if we carry it forward two more months, we, we now have, uh, January information. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I think it was positive January, but there, the point of this is to say the six month moving average of these numbers is definitely positive, not negative. So no sign of recession at the moment. Okay, let's go to um, the next slide. So prior to the invasion of Ukraine, the, the big worry about the market was um, the Fed raising rates. You know, not that there's anything good in an invasion of Ukraine, but on the, in the March Fed meeting, there, you know, the, the, there was a pretty decent likelihood that the Fed might have raised 50 basis points. Now they're thinking it's 25 basis points because the Fed, like everyone else, is concerned that the spillover effect of the Ukrainian invasion is potential recession. So they, they might be more cautious. You know, the other thing I just point out in this line is that uh, inflation is the thing the Fed is fighting. We, they don't want too much inflation. So they're going to raise interest rates to slow down economic activity to cool off inflation. But when you look at the market expectations on this chart, which is kind of that green greenish line there, you see it goes up to 2.01 and then it kind of rolls over. And actually in the longer run, it's down at 1.86. So that that's a way of saying that the, the, the people that are in the private sector that are concerned with bonds and interest rates and things like that, view inflation currently as temporary. You know, you hear people saying, well, if wages went up 5%, but inflation's up seven, that's terrible. Actually, if inflation's temporary and wages went up five, that's pretty good because it means long-term wages went up a lot versus real inflation. All right, let's go to the next slide. So again, a lot of this presentation was put together sort of prior to uh, the situation in Ukraine, and this is you know addressing issues in length about interest rates and equities and things like that. Again, I I think it's very difficult to really say much that's meaningful about what's going on in the Ukraine. Other than it is interesting to note, like I say, that after a couple of weeks, this, the S and P five hundred really hasn't deteriorated since the actual invasion. But anyway, on this chart, what we're showing is how high interest rates can go up before the stock market starts going down. And to make a long story short, this is saying the 10-year treasury rate can go all the way up to 3.6% before further rate increases cause stocks to go lower, uh, you know, longer term. Uh, so anyway, we now have a 10-year treasury at 1.9. We're a long ways away from 3.6. Uh, you know, a lot of people expect the 10-year treasury to go to two, two and a half, you know, something like that this year. Uh, I don't think there are many people thinking it's going to go to 3.6 this year. All right, let's go to the uh, uh, next slide. So what's driving the stock market uh, in 2022? One is that there's just a ton of capital. Uh, earnings growth is very strong and interest rates are, are low, even though they're rising, uh, relatively speaking, in an absolute sense, they're, they're still low. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So financial conditions are easy. You know, when you go to borrow money to buy a home or when corporations go to borrow money to, to uh, money's available, banks are 
are well stocked and trying to make loans. So capital is free flowing. And, and by the way, it's been it's more free flowing today than it's been in years. That's what this is a chart showing financial conditions dating all the way back to 1985. And the lower you go on the chart, the more free flowing capital is. So uh, next page. For, for corporations, you know, free, free flowing capital translates into going out and borrowing money at low rates. And um, then when they borrow money, it ends up usually back in the equity market in stock buybacks, uh, 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 dividend increases, mergers and acquisitions, and, and capital expenditures. Capital expenditures help shareholders in that they improve the company's productive capacity over time. And all of these measures are hitting record levels. So this is just a chart showing that U.S. stock share, uh, U.S. buyback authorizations are hitting record levels, and that's expected to continue right into 2022. Next slide. It shows M&A is hitting uh, all-time high levels. Mergers and acquisitions also provide sort of a valuation floor. So if stocks get too oversold, uh, they may just get bought by another company or go private. So that helps uh, put a floor in under the market. Next slide. Okay, earnings are exploding. You can see that this is a history of earnings dating back to 88. You see the next three years, these the earnings numbers of the S&P are you know, right up off the charts. It, does, it shows 2021. Uh, the reason why it's showing 2021 as an estimate is that uh, until, you know, for a month or two until it's all compiled, we won't know exactly what it is, but that's pretty close. Uh, in 2023, we're at 247 uh, in earnings. You know, just by the way, you take the S&P right now, 4259, that's at the moment, and you divide by 247, spot 37, and you get a P of about 17.2. Uh, relative to a 25-year average PE of forward 12 months of, let's say, 16.8. We're not wildly out of whack, so complaints about the market being expensive relative to earnings uh, may be, uh, you know, that's been alleviated in part by the market coming way back. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So what's happening in the market, or what started to happen, is that uh, you have two forces. You have the earnings growth you have two primary forces. Earnings growth is very strong, but you have a rising interest rate environment, meaning the multiple is being compressed. So just in 2021, we had about a 29% total return in the S&P, and that was based on a 47% increase in earnings. If you have a 47% increase in earnings, but only a 29% return in the index, that means that the price earnings multiple of the market uh, was declined. So the market actually became less expensive in 2021, and that process has continued into 2022. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a chart showing where, you know, what contributed to the S&P's advance last year. And, you know, the structure of the index is it's market cap weighted, meaning the top five or 10 stocks really account for most of the action. The bottom two or 300 stocks just don't matter. And this is what this chart's showing. The remaining 493 companies in the S&P are circled and, and they're all those little blue dots on the far left-hand side. And then you have the symbols like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Nvidia, Tesla, Facebook, Amazon. And that shows where the, you know, 35% of the S&P's performance came from these five stocks, Microsoft, Google, Nvidia. So when we ask what's gonna happen with the S&P, and the large part is what's going to happen with these, you know, mega cap, the top 10 stocks or the top five stocks. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, so these companies are called Fat FAM or FANG, and they're all kinds of abbreviations, but this is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, 23% of the S&P 500 market cap and 17% of the earnings. So uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, but this basically says these companies are growing uh, much faster than the S&P. They have much higher uh, margins. They um, uh, beat expectations by much larger amounts than the average S&P stock. So they've been a very powerful driver of the S&P. Let's go to the next slide. 
This is a, a chart looking at the profitability of these companies. So info, information technology stocks, their net profit margin is 25%. The s and is at 12.6. So you've got the absolute biggest companies in the market with double the net profit growing faster with bigger upside. And oh, by the way, they've been slaughtered. Google and Amazon have been absolutely hammered this year and are trading at, you know, in my opinion, extremely reasonable valuations. Um, we have an analyst that follows Google and he thinks that Google's trading on core earnings, something like less than 20 times uh, forward 12 month core earnings. You know, you look at that and you compare it to a Pepsi with much less growth, much smaller net margins, and that's trading at 25 times. So I think in many ways, the, uh, the NASDAQ collapse of 20% has clearly de-risked the market substantially. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is a, a slide that, you know, on, a, on, the, on the most highest level shows a blue line that goes up and down. Okay, that represents the typical uh, sort of business cycle. And it also represents sort of typical capital expenditures where you go through an expansion, you peak, you contract, you expand, you peak, you contract. And that's how the, you know, we've all sort of learned the business cycle. We go through these, you know, rise, peak, contract, trough, rise. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now this overlays, it, it separates old economy spending from new economy spending. And you can see there's a difference in the way new economy spending looks versus old economy. New economy spending is just up and to the right. It's that red dotted line. And in 2002, that was 25% of the total expenditure. And when I say new economy, I'm talking about technology spending. People buy PCs, software, whatever, whether in a recession, a pandemic, a growth period, it doesn't matter, they just buy this. So, and now this new economy spending is 55% of the total. So as new economy spending becomes a bigger piece of the overall capital expenditure budget, basically the entire US is becoming much less cyclical. The business environment in the US is becoming much less cyclical and much faster growth. All right, let's go to the next slide. We can skip this one. And the reason why I'm saying we can skip it is because it's already out of date with the decline in, in, the, in the top 10 stocks. Uh, this was just saying that they represent a large portion. Yeah, hold, oh, yeah, okay. They represent a large portion of the market and they seem expensive. That's you know not the case. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> You know, uh, when, well, we can, we'll have time for questions uh, because I am doing this rather rapidly, but this is just an incredibly important slide. This is uh, what's going on in the bond market. And uh, what's going on in the bond market, we started a new credit cycle. And specifically what that means is that, um, well, let's go through it. So we went into the pandemic of 2020 uh, they shut down many businesses, the outlook was unclear, and weak companies went out of business. Other companies uh, went out, and, and by the way, interest rates were taken to zero. Other companies went out and refinanced their debt. So they extended maturities and they lowered their interest rate costs. And so now delinquencies are going to be very low for a long period of time. In fact, they're the lowest they've ever been right now. Um, so what that means is that, and credit cycles, by the way, last for years. So when you're in a bullish credit cycle, you're usually in a bullish stock market. Again, capital that flows into the companies through the debt market flows into the equity market. So that's all very bullish. And let's go to the next slide. The quality of corporate debt has gotten better. So in this last period after the COVID sort of, let's say, balance sheet cleanup, um, the, uh, the number of, this is comparing the sort of the, the high yield debt market, corporate debt market from 2008 to 2021. And basically the point of the chart is to say that the double B portion of the market, that's the sort of the higher rated uh, junk debt portion of the corporate debt market is now a much bigger percent than it used to be. Meaning the credit quality, the way these companies are rated is better, materially better than what it was in 2008. So, uh, not only do we have uh, sort of the start of a new credit cycle, we have companies that are incredibly well financed, tons of cash on the balance sheet, very low interest payments, extended maturities. So that's when that situation changes, we should get worried about the stock market, but that's a situation not likely to change for a number of years. 
Let's go to the next cycle, the next chart. So uh, people like to say that the stock market goes up about 7% a year in real terms uh, over the long period of time. And what they're doing usually is, you know, taking a, a line from 1900 to today, and they're saying the average is 7% increase per year. But uh, it turns out that there are long periods of time when the market goes sideways and actually has major drawdowns, and then it goes up, and then it goes sideways, goes up. I mean, the last period of uh, sideways with big drawdowns was 2000 to 2014. You know, we had the 2000 to 2002 drawdown, we have the 2008 and 9 drawdown, each about 50%. And the market, you know, you could have bought the S&P at 1500 and 2000, you could have bought it at 1500 and 2007, and you could buy it at 1500 and 2014. In other words, you know, from peak to peak to peak, no appreciation. And now we're in a bull move. And these bull moves last for years. So, until you know, we receive the, the memo that says we're not in a bull move, we're in a bull move. And all the supporting evidence, in other words, no recession, uh, the credit markets, uh, the growth of earnings, all these things indicate that the bull move will extend. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And this is just showing that the average return in bull cycles, you know, we talked again about a 7% average for all time. But it, it's lumpy, right? Like the bull cycles, you're getting double digit return. The bear cycles, you're getting you know low single digits and you're getting a lot of opportunity to have it, to lock in big losses if you panic in the downturns. So we're in a bull cycle, typical of the bull cycles. You know, we're seeing, you know, 2014 through uh, November, 2021, uh, the average, the S&P average annual return was 14.9. That's completely typical. That's exactly what happened from 1950 to 1968. 1980 to 1999 was even better. So uh, what's going on in the market, although we keep talking about the new, new thing and slower growth and this and that, but what's happening in the stock market looks very typical of what's happened throughout the years. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a slide that I just, I just enjoy seeing. It's not actually presenting you much new information, but it's reiterating the idea that there are these bearish periods that last for years, and then there are these bullish periods that last for years. What the chart is showing you is the number of new highs by year. And on the left-hand side, we start, you know, see 1929, 45 new highs. And then we end the, enter a bear market in 1930, where we don't see any new highs all the way until 1953. So that's pretty bad. And then 1954, we go into a bull cycle that goes on to 1968, lots of new highs. 1969 to 1979, another bear market. It did have 1972 and 73 had a few new highs, but generally a bear market. You can see if you go to the far right, 2013 through 2021, pretty robust. I mean, every single year, new highs. And some years, like last year, was the second highest number of new highs of any year uh, in the history of the market. Okay, let's look at the next slide. So the markets are down. You know, we have the S&P down. Uh, let's just take a look right now. We'll get a reading. Um, S&P down, you know, rough number. Hold on. Uh, about 10% after today's action, if it holds up. And the Q, you know, the NASDAQ down about 20. Okay, should we buy it or not? Uh, well, if you decide that there's not going to be a recession this year, that somehow we'll... we'll We'll move through the Ukrainian situation without that causing recession. It's probably a pretty good time to buy. The reason for that, for me saying that, is when you look at the entire stock market history going back to 1900, if you say, what were the two worst years when there was no recession? It's 1957 and 1966. And in both cases, the market was down slightly under 11%. That's where we are today. So, you know, presumably, if we don't have a recession, and this market's no worse than it's been in the last 121 years, you'd come out worst case flat. Uh, we actually still think you're, you know, we'll see an S&P 500 of about 5,200. And so there's, if that's the case, uh, let's just do the math on that. You'd have about a 22% return from current levels uh, if we don't see a recession. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
So, you know, stocks are a risk asset and to buy a risk asset, you need to be paid a premium because you could just go buy a risk-free asset and receive that return and not accept any risk. So what we do is we looked at, we try and solve for something called the risk premium. And we take current stock values uh, and we, we look at that relative to earnings divided by the risk-free interest rate plus some risk premium. If we go to the next slide, this shows the risk premium that we calculate from 2000 through 2022. And right now we think the risk premium is high. You know, whether is it 5% or is it three and a half percent? You know, that's this top line on 2022. It, it's, it's not that important what the number is, if it's in that range. What's important is it's not negative or zero. And you can see in 2000 and 2001, the risk premium was negative or zero. In other words, you were not being paid to take the risk of buying stocks. And it turned out that that was exactly what happened. It was a terrible thing that you should not have bought stocks. They were wildly overvalued and the market got crushed down 50% and the NASDAQ was down 82%. In 2007, you can see the risk premium was extremely low, you know, basically negligibly positive. So again, you weren't getting paid to take risk. The average of these numbers is about 3.7. And right now you're getting paid more than the average amount and you could say, well, that's because the risk seems more than average with the Ukrainian situation. But in any event, you are being paid to take that risk. So it's not like we're looking at a uh, zero or a negative risk premium. So we think that's, that's encouraging. This is always a good check when you're stepping into a market, which people are talking about as maybe being expensive and there's a lot of risk. The question is, are you getting paid to take the risk? And the answer we think is yes. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, bad news, when the S&P gains 25% in a year, it's never gained more the following year. The good news is that it's higher 85% of the time and the average gain in the following year is 11%. So we go to the next slide. This shows that uh, you know, each year where the S&P was up by 25% or more, what happened the next year? And, that, and that's what this chart's showing. And so there's the data this supported the last comment. And you can see generally it's a bullish year with an average of 11.6% up. Okay, so uh, that's really the presentation. If you want copies of the slides, you know, go, you could send an email to us. It says info, you know, at info at deltaif.com and we'll get you the slides. And, and like I say, we have this newsletter uh, and uh, that's what I have to say about that. Okay, so we can go ahead and open it up for questions and answers if you have them. Um, I think I can't tell if I see them in the chat here. Does anybody have a question in the chat? I'm trying to look here. Um, Bill Buchanan's hands up. Not Bill Buchanan. Uh, good morning, Nick. Uh, Bill Buchanan. Uh, nice, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, this is an area that's so arcane that you know most most people can't track, track it. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is uh, some refer to Ukraine as the, you know, the breadbasket of the world. Uh, now, so we're getting into a, a question that has to do with, uh, you know, agricultural commodities. Let's assume that, you know, the Russian army is successful and, uh, you know, it takes over Ukraine. And uh, so production is, is, is significantly reduced. What effect uh, do you think that's gonna have on US agricultural production? I think in the short term, obviously it's gonna create some inflation, but basically they're already talking about US producers shifting the harvest, I mean, the, the planting toward, more towards grain, you know, wheat. Remember back uh, in the early eighties, the Russians used to, they used to produce a lot of wheat, but they wouldn't deliver it to their people because they didn't have any financial incentives. So everybody was starving and so, uh, Reagan had to make decisions about, do I give Russians wheat or not? And we ended up, but the point being, there have been periods of history where Ukraine, Russia has failed to produce much wheat and the U.S. has made up the entire difference. I don't think that, you know, I think the U.S. can, can make up much of the difference. So I don't, I'm not, I think they do 10% of the wheat market. So it's clearly going to be disruptive short term, but I don't think that they're, productive capacity would prevent us from 
making up the difference if necessary over time. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, last question, uh, Nick, is uh, what's your uh, five-year prognosis, if you can do it, for a value portfolio? <laughs> you know, I'll just say this. Predicting long-term is always a bad idea, but okay. they say that after recessions, value stocks tend to outperform. The recession would be the very, very short shock we had with COVID. There was a period of, you know, we did have two quarters of contracting GDP. So technically there was a recession. I think of it more of just a shock, but if history holds true, then value stocks outperform. Value, you know, it would be financials, energy. Now, clearly those have been doing very well, you know, turbocharged by events in Ukraine on the energy side. So, you know, this year financials have been doing, I mean, value has been doing better than growth and that disparity between the returns and growth and value got way out of whack. So it's, it's completely reasonable to think that value will outperform growth for a period of time, I don't, I don't know if it's five years or what period, but uh, that I think is a very reasonable statement. The only thing I'd only caveat on that is that it's getting to a point in the sell-off that Google and Amazon big cap growth looks pretty much like value. Hmm. Hmm. So I don't, I don't oh. run from that. Okay, now Brian Head has a question. Are you concerned about the thirty percent increase in the um, was it M2 money supply last year and the effect on inflation? Uh, so, you know, inflation, so that, so basically the, the deal with money supply is, you know, the, how much do we turn the money? What's our, you know, you put money out in the economy and how many times does it turn over? And the turnover, I'm forgetting the term for that, but the, the turnover rate of money in the US economy has been shrinking incessantly. So I don't, I don't really worry so much about the money supply versus inflation, particularly because now the Fed's going to start reducing money supply. But what I do worry, you know, we had the supply chain shocks. We have uh, the people of the United States loaded with cash wanting to buy stuff. And now you put the Ukrainian thing in there where oil is going through the roof, food's going to, you know, agricultural prices are going up. Uh, this inflation problem is going to be, and you know, obviously, rising wages is long-term inflationary. That's that's an inflation area that's hard to turn off. You know, the hope was that supply chain would get better, goods would start flowing better, and inflation would cool off because basically the supply of product like bicycles and cars and whatever else would rebound. You know, that should happen. Um, but I'm a, yeah. I'm a, of the monetary school uh, persuasion, and Milton Friedman said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. So that exponential rise in the money supply last year very much concerns me. And I think that will have it. A, I'm really concerned about a possible hyperinflation coming. Yeah, well, the worst case is stagflation, right? Because basically, people's behavior starts, their consumption starts slowing because of high gas prices and inflation's persistent because the, the reason, the things that are causing it are, I don't, you know, are supply constraints. Okay, cool. Um, Carl Walsh had a question and then Antonio, I don't know who was first, but uh, Carl's is in the uh, chat here. Um, Sorry, if I can say, it. Carl, you want to go with it or? Sure, sure. Um, I'm, I've am i always been interested on how the market outlook and the market per performance uh, translates down to small business, which of course is the largest part of the economy. How, how, how does that, are they linked at all? You know, the crude answer is no. I mean, the indirect answer is, yeah, everybody should be employed and first have a growing economy. Everybody needs money in their pocket and they have to go out and buy stuff. But what's really moving the S&P is, you know, some trillion dollar market cap companies and, you know, Carnival Cruise, cruise Lines can go out of business. All the restaurants can go out of business. All the, you know, all that stuff 
uh, a lot of retailers can go out of business. It doesn't make any difference from the, you know, as long as everybody goes to Amazon and shops or as long as they, you know, fool around on Google and pay, you know, and Google sells ads. You know, over time though, the, the fundamental health of the economy is gonna be determined by are people employed, which by the way, they are, you know, are, are their wages rising? Yes, they are. Uh, is, are there, is their net worth going up over time? Yes, it is. But, you know, it is disturbing when you see situations where Main Street America is just not great you know, as a result of shutdowns or whatever it may be. And yet that's completely detached from the market. Okay, Antonio White, the pitch freak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Nick, a terrific presentation here. Uh, I've got three options. You pick which one you want to talk about, right? One is private equity growth trends. Uh, specifically, private equity has been gigantic last year, record amounts of money invested uh, last year from private equity. The other one is small caps effect on the market here. And what might you think about the contribution, positive or negative for that? Or uh, crypto's impact on the market. Where are we going as far as policy uh, is concerned? Pick whichever one you'd like to respond to. I'd be grateful. Okay, I'm just going to talk about private equity. And all I'd say about private equity is the argument for it is that, you know, the number of publicly traded equities has come down to about 4,000 from about 8,000, rough number. And meanwhile, the number of private equity opportunities has gone through the roof. So people are out pushing private equity a lot. Um, and they're also talking about the fact that companies are staying private a lot longer. So when you're buying into private equity today, you're getting a much more mature, developed, profitable company than you used to, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, the only thing I'd say about private equity, though, is that all those funds are levered funds for the most part. So if you pull the leverage out of the funds and you start looking at non-levered return, uh, honestly, I'm not really seeing the, uh, the benefit of it particularly because the lack of liquidity to me is a major risk item. So if, you know, we'll see, it's private equity is being pushed hard by a lot of firms all over the place because they, you know, they need to fund their funds to go out and play the game. But just remember, it's always a levered return. And if you, if you count for the size of the things you're investing in, plus the leverage, plus the lack of liquidity, I, I don't know if it's worth it. Okay. Any other questions? Any? I'm going to ask about to go expand on uh, the crypto question that Antonio asked. I'd like to hear that. Well, I'm like the last person in the world you should ever ask about crypto because I don't know much about it at all. Okay. Uh, uh, how's how's it affecting the stock market? I don't know. You know, I do know that younger people like to. Uh, you know, when they look at their investments, they want a certain portion in crypto. It appears that, you know, there's been a migration of substantial material firms that are moving into crypto. So it looks like in one form or another, it's going to be with us. Uh, uh, but that's about all I, I don't, you know, I don't have much more to say about it. I, you know, one thing that's interesting about this entire conflict is, you know, if you look back at it, People talking about money supply. What we pumped a lot of money into the world, the U dollars, to get out of the 2008 and 2009 crisis, and people were concerned. But it was not inflationary. We pumped a pile more into the market to deal with COVID. And people talked about it destroying the value of the dollar, and that eventually the dollar would never be the world's currency and all that. First thing to know is that basically, starting in 1971, all oil has to be traded in dollars. Almost all commodities are traded in dollars. And when basically the world is very distressed, people go to the dollar. And if you look at the US dollar, it's actually doing very, very well. Um, so I'm not a believer that the dollar is going away. You know, there, that, so we can have a dollar and we can have crypto, but the dollar in a very mixed up world uh, tends to do fine. So, and that's what's happening now. I don't know if you have prices of the dollar, but the dollar has appreciated quite a bit in the last, you know, even since last summer. I say uh, something that uh, the IRS is really jumping all over this crypto stuff uh, as far as taxation and identification. And they have a whole group of people that are looking at it. Yes. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Nick? Before we, 
All right. That's wonderful. Nick, thank you so much for an interesting presentation. Everybody give Nick a big round of applause. Uh, appreciate you coming every year to, uh, you know, at least the last few to uh, help us with this outlook. And this year, you know, we thought we were heading out of COVID and into a nice smooth year. Well, oh, well, it changes. So, and it is. So, <laughs> so anyway.